To stay up to date on all the voting rights and election news you need, click on the link above to subscribe to Democracy Docket's daily and weekly newsletters. The year has only just begun, and already Republicans have filed nearly a dozen anti-voting lawsuits. Five of those lawsuits are in Arizona alone. This is a signal of a big plan the Republicans have to undermine elections and suppress voters. Welcome back to Defending Democracy. I'm Mark Elias. And I'm Paige Moskowitz. Let's get started. We are about 10 months away from Election Day, and already we're seeing a preview of what challenges voters may face in November. There has been a flurry of anti-voting lawsuits challenging how and when people can cast their ballots. Yeah, and look, Republicans are going after three things. They want to undermine election administration. They want to disenfranchise voters to make voting harder. And they want to subvert elections. Essentially, they want to make it harder to vote and easier to cheat. And they are doing this, Page, because they know that they don't command majority support from the electorate. You know, if you stack up, you know, if you set aside all of the drama of, you know, this and that in any given day, you just stack up Republican policies versus Democratic policies. The fact is the American public has shown over and over again that uh, they prefer electing Democrats and a Democratic agenda over Republicans uh, and a Republican agenda. And this has become an existential threat to the Republican Party. Um, they no longer try to compete for majorities of the voters. You know, in 2000, when George Bush lost a majority of the popular vote, he didn't celebrate it. He was happy to be president, but he he tried to take uh, steps in 2004 to win a majority of the vote. Well, Republicans no longer are trying to do that for president. They lost the popular vote in 2008, in 2012, in 2016, in 2020, uh, and, and will lose it again in 2024. They are left with how do they use the rules of voting? How do they use the rules of vote counting? How do they disqualify ballots? How do they do these things in order to allow themselves to exercise majority power without a um, uh, commanding a majority of the electorate. One of the ways they do that, that you and I have talked a lot about on this podcast, is through gerrymandering, right? Gerrymandering is just another way of govern of being able to govern without having popular support. So the changes we just saw in Wisconsin, where there will now be ungerrymandered state legislative maps, that was 10 years in the in the making to get to that point, 10 years of, of litigating and elections to finally get to that point because Republicans were not gonna give up power um, of being able to control two thirds of the seats in the legislature when only winning 50 or less than 50% of the vote. And so that's one way that Republicans have, um, have done this. But Paige, you know, one of the other trends that we have seen increasing in 20, since 2020 and we saw it in the election report that Democracy Docket put out uh, following 2023, and we're seeing it in these lawsuits in Arizona and around the country, is that they are now turning to the courts to literally bring lawsuits to try to undermine pro-voting rules. Like, you know, it was one thing when they were undermining, when they were defending voter suppression laws, but they've now gone a step further, Page. They are now literally attacking laws that are in on the books because they are afraid they are too pro-voter. Mark, and I think the question a lot of people are asking is why are Republicans bringing these lawsuits um, instead of just trying to change the laws, right? Like we know most state legislatures are controlled by Republicans. Why are they going the litigation route instead of the legislation route? So, you know, part of it is because um, uh, Democrats have done a good job electorally, right? So in states like Wisconsin, there's now a Democratic governor. In Arizona, uh, there is now a Democratic governor, a Democratic secretary of state, and a Democratic attorney general. Uh, and in Michigan, there is now a Democratic trifecta, which means there's a Democratic governor uh, uh, and state legislature. In Pennsylvania, Democratic now a Democratic governor and uh, one house of the legislature is Democratic. So some of it is they don't control as many levers of power as they did before, so they can't pass legislation. But the other thing is, Paige, that they have become more desperate to make changes to even laws passed by Republican legislators, uh, legislatures in the past, or passed on a bipartisan basis in the past. So some of the things they now want to achieve in court, 
they couldn't even get Republican legislatures to enact. Mark, you mentioned Arizona, and I want to focus on that state because, as we've said, it there's been nearly a dozen anti-voting lawsuits filed by Republicans. And let's be clear, when we say by Republicans, we mean by Republican-affiliated groups or literally the RNC or state Republican parties. There's been nearly a dozen filed so far this year. Five of those lawsuits were filed in Arizona so far. And to give some context, um, in 2022, the last major election year, there were 98 anti-voting lawsuits filed total across the entire year. At this point in 2022, there were only six lawsuits filed so far. So we're at nearly double that rate, 10 so far in 2024, five alone in Arizona. Why is the focus on Arizona? So look, before we get to Arizona, I think your numbers are really important. I mean, setting aside for a second what was done in 2022, if you just take the fact that in the first you know, uh, a little over a month, month and a half, they filed 10 lawsuits. And then you look at the pro-democracy forces filing litigation. You know, rough math, and I grant you this is rough math, you're talking about being on pace for as, for potentially 200 lawsuits this year. Uh, and that's before you got to the post-election litigation. So the, the 10 lawsuits is a blistering pace out of the gate. Uh, for the vote suppressors. And, you know, really, I think, portends a lot more litigation. Plus, Paige, you know, we've seen Donald Trump um, attack Rona McDaniel, who has now lost her job as the chair soon and presumably going to change her name back to Romney uh, when she leaves the chair's role. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the reasons why she's been replaced, according to news reports, is because Donald Trump doesn't think she's being li a, a litigation aggressive enough. She doesn't, he doesn't think that the Republicans are doing enough to suppress voting rights. So I think this is going to be a very year for democracy docket. And, and I think that everyone who is listening to this right now needs to go to democracydocket.com and click on subscribe because the information that democracy docket provides you um, on in its daily and weekly newsletters will keep you up to date with all of these updates, including what's happening in Arizona. So let's, let's uh, and, and the link is uh, right above uh, and also in the show notes. So let's though talk about Arizona specifically. Um, we are seeing this litigation in Arizona because of two reasons. The first is, as you say, Arizona has become a swing state, right? Arizona is now um, on the knife's edge of who wins control of the Senate, uh, the presidency and the House. So that's one reason. The second, though, is that um, we are seeing Republicans afraid of a document called the Election Procedures Manual. Now, why they would be afraid of an election procedure manual tells you probably more about the sorry state of America of, of the Republican Party today, because all the election procedural manual is, it is a rule book for how elections are run in the state. Its mission is to create uniform, uh, accurate, and efficient elections in the state of Arizona. It is literally the local election official Bible of like how you open the polls, how you run the elections, how you, you know, count ballots. It's a very sort of meticulous, fair, even-handed document that historically has not been very controversial. This year, uh, it uh, has been rewritten because under uh, state law, it has to be rewritten every two years. Uh, and uh, it was rewritten and published. And uh, it's the first manual uh, that has been rewritten in four years because uh, two years ago it was supposed to be rewritten, but it didn't, uh, it didn't make it all the way through the process. It's very important that it be rewritten in time for a presidential year. Um, but yet, Paige, it has garnered not one, not two, but three separate lawsuits. I mean, who sues over an election procedure manual? I'll tell you who, the Republican Party and its allies. And it's not like this was a surprise to Republicans, right? They knew this new EPM was coming. They knew that the Democratic Secretary of State, Adrian Fontes, was writing the EPM. You know, it really formalized a lot of the practices Arizona had already been doing, right? Like, really nothing in this EPM is completely new and surprising. But like you said, it garnered three lawsuits so far from Republican groups. So why are they so scared of the EPM? Yeah. So I think to understand why they are freaked out, you have to understand the history of Arizona, you know, because as you point out, the EPM 
is not really a controversial document normally. And not only did, were Republicans aware it was coming out because like the law requires it to come out, but also it was put out for public comment. Like, and as you say, like most, you know, virtually everything in it is non-controversial. It is simply, it is simply documenting the way in which uh, local election officials conduct elections. But to understand why they're, why they are targeting it in 2024, um, you have to understand what went on from 1995 to 2019 which is that during that time period, you had Republican secretaries of state who wrote the prior versions of the EPA, right? Because fundamentally, Arizona was a Republican state. It had two Republican senators. It had two, it had um, Republican governors and Republican statewide officials during most of that time period. You know, people don't realize right now you have two Democratic senators, but but that's an anomaly in the recent you know, decades of history in Arizona. Um, Barack Obama, who won the presidency in a landslide, and I mean a landslide, in 28, uh, 2008. I mean, he won Indiana and he won North Carolina. He lost Arizona by nine points. He lost Arizona um, by eight plus points in 2012. This was not a swingy state. Uh, the first Democratic governor, uh, 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 Katie Hobbs, uh, the gov current Democratic governor, Katie Hobbs, is the first Democratic governor since 2009. Um, so when this state went blue in 2020 at the presidential level, it was the first time since Bill Clinton carried the state in 1996. Um, so the EPM had become this very non-controversial document. But in the its status as a swing state, all hell's broken loose because Republicans now fear that that unless they rig the rules, this slide towards being a more democratic state is going to continue. And Mike, I think we should also mention Arizona still has a Republican controlled state legislature, but the governor, AG, secretary of state are all Democrats. You mentioned Governor Katie Hobbs. She used to be the secretary of state of Arizona. She's a very proud vocal supporter of voting rights. She thinks, you know, states shouldn't try to block voting access in any way. So there is a lot of tension within Arizona officials that probably would make it unlikely for there to be new election legislation passed, even more so voter suppression legislation passed. Yeah. And it's very interesting, Paige, because... Uh, you know, you mentioned she's a former secretary of state and you mentioned the secretary, the current secretary of state. He was actually the former chief election official in Maricopa County. So in some ways, you know, the 2024 EPM was drafted by a former local election official. It was approved by the former secretary of state. All of this was done pursuant to a direct order, a direct you know, mandate by the legislature, which is to promulgate every two years an EPM. And so, you know, and, and of course it was put out for comment. It was based on consultations with local election officials. It was, um, uh, it, who are bipartisan, uh, uh, and it built on a lot of previous portions of the EPM that had been, been passed by Republicans. So this is not a partisan document. I mean, this is a very sort of routine thing that the legislature ordered to be done and where you have a lot of expertise going into it. So when you look at the freakout page, you really are kind of left asking why of all of the places in America, if you're the RNC, you could freak out about election laws and of all of the documents you could freak out about why in Arizona. Right. So, Mark, let's get into these lawsuits and break down what's happening them. Like we said, there are five lawsuits filed so far in Arizona. Three are about the EPM itself. Now, the three lawsuits are from Republican lawmakers, a conservative group called the Arizona Free Enterprise Club. And the third is from the Republican National Committee and the state Republican Party. They're all challenging various provisions of the EPM, restrictions around voter registration cancellation and ballot challenges, rules about election certification and proof, documentary proof of citizenship to vote. These are all provisions that were written in reaction to real events in Arizona. These aren't hypotheticals. These are real issues that the state deals with, and the EPM is a response to that. Now, most of these lawsuits argue that Fontes overstepped his power to create these rules and that it violates the state constitution or state law or the U.S. Constitution. And Mark, we'll definitely get into this RNC lawsuit. But first, I want to talk about the lawsuit from the Arizona Free Enterprise Club. 
because they're specifically challenging provisions that prevent voter harassment and intimidation. Yeah, who does that? I mean, like, like literally, I read the lawsuit and I was thinking, who files a lawsuit to challenge a provision that prohibits activity, quote, with the intent or effect of threatening, harassing, intimidating, or coercing voters? Like, who files a lawsuit to be on the, the pro side of threatening, harassing, intimidating, or coercing voters? Like, you'd think if there was one thing there might be a bipartisan consensus on, it is that we should not have people threatening, harassing, or intimidating, or coercing voters. But no, there is literally a lawsuit in Arizona by this group that seeks to strike down a provision that bans that activity. What else does their lawsuit do? Their lawsuit, um, uh, uh, you know, is basically uh, a, an effort to reinstate the the horrendous activities that we saw in the past in Arizona, including last last uh, in 2022, last election, when we saw armed people in body armor staking out drop boxes with video cameras, intimidating people who were, wait for it, put it dropping off their ballots. That's it. That's all they were doing. I mean, all the voters were doing here that that landed them in this in the crosshairs of these voter suppression intimidation groups. All they were doing was returning their mail in ballots by putting it in a secure metal container called the Dropbox. And this led to harassment. Um, and and so, you know, we saw people intentionally following people to their drop boxes and videotaping, yelling at them. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, and and the idea that there is a lawsuit to try to justify that or to not even justify it, but to try to allow it to continue when the election officials are simply trying to create a safe environment for people to be able to vote and drop off their ballot. I mean, Paige, I was going to ask the question, is this what, what the Republican Party and the conservative movement has become? But obviously it is. But but this does not speak well of, of, of what, we, what we're going to see out of the right wing constellation of voter suppression groups in the next, uh, in the next few months. Right. They're fighting these provisions that prevent voter intimidation and harassment. And let's be clear, voter intimidation is not just illegal on the state level, but the federal level as well. Right, Mark? Yeah, it's a, it, it violates federal law, it violates federal criminal law. There can be civil litigation. Civil lawsuits uh, brought under provisions that ban it on a civil level, and it's and and many many states, you know, many many states already prohibit this, and more states are taking steps on a bipartisan basis in some places to prohibit it because you want to protect voters, you want to protect election officials, right? Like, it's just incredible. If I sound incredulous, it is because I am that anyone would challenge a law that is aimed at preventing voter harassment or intimidation. Mark, and on top of all of that, the RNC is also involved in fighting these rules. Yeah, I mean, the RNC is just terrible. I mean, the RNC is just a terrible organization. I mean, it may be that the only thing that Donald Trump and I agree on is that the RNC is a terrible organization. Now, unfortunately, he thinks it's terrible because it's not terrible enough. And I think it's terrible because, well, it's terrible. Um, but the fact is the RNC is spending um, their donors' money. I mean, I suppose if you're a donor, you say, well, he's not going to like Donald Trump's legal fees, right? But they're spending their donors' money to bring litigation uh, to challenge voting rights, to restrict voting rights, at the same time that they are also spending their money telling voters to, quote unquote, bank their vote, right? So, so let's unpack this. On the one hand, on the one hand, you have the Republican National Committee starting this program, which they have sold to the mainstream media. It was a scam from the beginning. I said it was a scam and I was right. But they convinced the mainstream media that, look, we're a new thing. We, we're a new committee. We want people to bank their vote. You can go to a website. I'm not gonna, not gonna point and put it up here. So no point down, no point at all, okay? Don't want you to put up this, uh, this, this video because it's to a scam site. But it's an RNC site that tells Republicans, you should vote by mail. You should vote early. You should bank your vote, right? Because we believe in vote by mail. At the same time that they're doing that page, they're bringing these lawsuits, including in Arizona, 
challenging basically every aspect of mail-in voting, right? So at the one point, they're telling people to vote by mail. At the other point, they're trying to make it harder to vote by mail. While at the same time, by the way, Donald Trump is telling Republicans that vote by mail is a fraud. Like a recent Pew poll showed that only 28% of Republicans believe you ought to have no excuse vote by mail. We saw in New York, they tried to block vote by mail before that special congressional election. And in Arizona, we see they're litigating, but at the same time, they're trying to run this national program. It's a total fraud. If Donald Trump wants to know what the fraud is, the RNC is the total fraud. And this lawsuit is a terrible thing for democracy and they ought to be ashamed of themselves. So Paige, there are two other lawsuits that I feel like we've got to cover here. Um, even though, you know, in some ways, this is just like the right wing playing its greatest hits of, of complaints. Um, the first is a challenge uh, by uh, a, uh, a individual in Mojave County. He is a local election official, even though um, he's actually the Mojave County supervisor or one of the supervisors, although he claims this is a lawsuit brought in his individual capacity. Um, and uh, he is... Uh, trying to resurrect yet again the um, effort to have hand counting. Um, we've talked uh, like a, a thousand times about why this is a terrible idea and more importantly, why it <laughs> transgresses uh, Arizona state law. And in many respects, this is just a continuation of the same set of attacks we continue to see out of Republicans in Arizona about the manner by which ballots are counted. And as importantly, and I think that sometimes this gets overlooked, that elections are accurately certified. You know, one of the reasons why I suspect these folks continue, and not just this guy, but but these lawsuits continue is because they actually don't want to certify Democrats the winner <laughs> when they win. Uh, and so they want to do hand counting of ballots as a essentially a protest against um, uh, accurate certifying of elections because, you know, hand counting of ballots was not a thing that we heard a lot about from Republicans uh, uh, in Arizona or elsewhere until Donald Trump lost in 2020, and then particularly in Arizona uh, until uh, Democrats essentially swept uh, the state uh, in 2022. So that lawsuit, I don't think is probably going anywhere. My firm has uh, represented some plaintiffs, some uh, defendants intervene. It's a lawsuit against uh, the attorney general. Um, you know, I, I, I just I have nothing but contempt for the waste of resources that goes into uh, these repeated efforts to undermine the simple process of counting and certified counting ballots and certified elections. But Paige, you know, this is not going to be the last one we say, you know, this is going to be this whole, when I say that Republicans want to make it harder to vote and easier to cheat, you know, that easier to cheat part is, is part of the equation. And, you know, regardless of this one case in Mojave, I think that there's, you are going to see more right-wing activists in, Ohio, in uh, Arizona and around the country bring lawsuits to try to undermine confidence in the counting process. Because once you undermine count confidence in the counting process, it becomes a much easier process or much easier to convince people that uh, not to certify election results or that the certified election results are uh, not accurate. But but that is in some ways the less alarming of the two cases that I wanted to discuss. The other one, Paige, our friend Stephen Miller is back. Stephen Miller, you may remember he was, you know, seen sitting across from Lou Dobbs being chastised because, like, honestly, I was kicking their ass in court over and over again, and Lou Dobbs was very angry about it. So he actually proposed to Stephen Miller that Stephen Miller and the RNC pay me $500 million just to stop beating them in court. Like, so this is the way it would work, is that that Stephen Miller would get a half a billion dollars. Now, Paige, we know he couldn't get the half a million dollars from Donald Trump because Donald Trump doesn't have a half a billion dollars, right? He's currently short on that cash in New York, so it wouldn't come from him, but maybe they'd raise it from their unsuspecting donors. They would then give me the half a billion dollars to stop litigating and beating them in court. So it's that Stephen Miller that is now the very stern looking legal eagle who is now refashioned himself into the foil of democracy and the person who stands up, uh, uh, you know, uh, for voter suppression in courtrooms around the country. But his latest case, uh, or cases, as we should, I guess, perhaps say, is a sort of a repackaging of parts of the Kerry Lake lawsuit, which, by the way, has not yet been dismissed. I mean, you know, Kerry Lake is running for Senate, but Kerry Lake also believes she's currently the governor um, because she's continuing her gubernatorial contest. Um, 
that she uh, has stretched on and on here. Uh, and Stephen Miller, you know, kind of in that vein, um, had his group bring a lawsuit against Maricopa County, which is Phoenix, which, you know, is not, a, you know, is it runs perfectly fine elections. Republicans have been deeply involved in the administration of those elections for years. Um, and he, uh, his group brought a lawsuit on behalf of an entity called Strong Communities Foundation of Arizona uh, to, to challenge a whole host of ways in which Maricopa County um, administers elections. Uh, they are complaining about chain of custody laws, ballot reconciliation, sir, signature verification, ballot curing, registration cancellations, drop boxes. It's like it's it's the greatest hits laundry list of complaints that we see recycled over and over again, both in Arizona and elsewhere. Well, he filed this case in Maricopa County, um, presumably because, well, it's a lawsuit in which he's trying to attack Maricopa County. Uh, but I guess no one told him that, you know, if you file a lawsuit in Maricopa County against Maricopa County, you know, the judges might not be so sympathetic to throwing out the election rules in Maricopa County. So he wants to now sue Maricopa County, but in Yavapai, um, in a clear effort to, which is a rural county in Arizona, uh, and nothing against the judges or the judicial system in Yavapai, but, but he wants to sue Maricopa County. So he has contorted this thing where he essentially dismissed his case in Maricopa County. We moved to intervene. He dismissed it. Not saying that that's why, but could be. Uh, and decided to file the, essentially the same lawsuit, but add Yavapai, which he really doesn't have any dispute with Yavapai County. But it's a way of bootstrapping, he thinks, Maricopa County into this case that he wants heard in um, this more rural county. Um, we'll see whether or not that ultimately works. You know, the state of Arizona is suffice to say, not amused <laughs> by this antic uh, on Stephen Miller's part. Um, but Stephen Miller is very sternly looking at the camera and saying, yes, this is what we're doing. Um, but the state of Arizona, not amused by this. Um, my legal team um, is going to move to intervene there as well, because we think that these election procedures were fine, whether they are challenged in Maricopa County or in Yavapai. But that's where we are, Paige. This is basically, it looks like, mostly a venue shopping exercise on Stephen Miller's behalf. Um, for those wondering, I didn't take the half a billion dollars. So have no fear. I am here still fighting for the good guys, still fighting for democracy. Mark, like I said at the start of this episode, Democracy Docket tracked 98 anti-voting lawsuits filed in 2022. 17 of those lawsuits were filed in Arizona. Now, Lawsuits normally take a little while to play out, but 15 of those cases have been decided so far. And 14 of those decisions, 14 of the 15 cases that have been decided were, there were decisions that were issued that were victories for voters or they were neutral and just kind of kept the status quo. All in all, it's clear Republicans aren't great at filing and winning these lawsuits. We saw that in 2022, but why are these lawsuits bad even if the GOP likely won't win them? Yeah, I mean, saying that the Republicans are not great at winning lawsuits might be the understatement of this podcast. Um, the Republicans have a terrible track record of of litigation around elections. I mean, you know, let's start with the fact that Donald Trump and his allies managed to lose um, uh, 60 plus lawsuits in the post-election in federal and state courts around the country in what was an epic debacle. Then you get into 2021 and 2022 and 2023 when Democracy Docket has has documented over and over again what a bad litigation record they have. But as you say, they are still at it, um, and they are and and they are bringing them with increasing frequency. So you ask the right question, which is why? Why are they doing this? And I think that 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 people, smart people, need to understand the Republicans have three goals with these lawsuits. Um, the first is that maybe they can win you know that that's like that's like in some ways an ancillary goal but we we can't pass we can't we can't pass by it i mean they did win one of the 15 lawsuits so that's 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 one goal um the second is that they want to motivate their base and 
you know, Republicans are in a tough spot because the the operative class, at least the ones that have been around the Republican Party for a long time, knows that this is counterproductive. That's why they rolled out that bank your vote thing, right? Because they know that it's actually counterproductive to motivate your base against <laughs> against uh, methods of voting, but they can't do anything about it, right? At this point, Donald Trump is all in on this, and so they have to go with it. So it, even though it may seem like a very curious tactical decision, um, uh, but they, they, they have to tell their people that the elections are rigged because that is what, that is the base that Donald Trump has built their party on. And so they're kind of stuck. And then the, the third, which I think is, um, uh, the, the really, you know, underreported piece of this is that they are already laying the predicate to the, why they lost in 2024, you know? Lawsuit grievance becomes a mechanism by which they explain why they lose. Um, it sets up now the underpinnings of the criticisms they will launch later as to why they didn't prevail. We saw this in 2020 when Donald Trump was making outlandish claims about vote by mail in the run up to 2020 and people were scratching their heads. Why is he doing this? This is counterproductive. Well, he was doing it in part because he was setting up January 6th. You know, January 6th didn't just happen. It's not like all of a sudden on January 5th at 5 p.m., all of these people texted each other and said, hey, you know, what we got to do. We got to go to the Capitol. The predicate for January 6th was was laid with the serial lying that Donald Trump did day in and day out before the election, the serial lying he and his team did after the election. And so, you know, the lying they're doing now, the litigation that they're laying down now where they lose creates a grievance mentality based on the big lie, on bigger and bigger lies um, that will allow them in the post-2024 context to um, explain why they lost. We saw this page in Arizona in 2022, right? I mean, look at the coverage the Democracy Docket did of the complaints uh, by Kerry Lake uh, uh, and Abe Hamada about how they lost their elections in 2022 for governor and for, uh, for, um, for attorney general. I mean, to this day, Kerry Lake is still fighting in court, saying that the election procedures in 2022 uh, were unfair. They continued to blame their loss on the election procedures rather than on the fact that they were bad candidates running on unpopular ideas. And so, you know, they Republicans are relying on suppressing the vote and cheating, right? They want to make it harder to vote and easier to cheat. And Democracy Docket, we spend so much of our time outing their voter suppression ideas that we have to realize that some of what they're doing now, some of these bogus lawsuits they are filing now are just like the bogus lawsuits Donald Trump filed after the 2020 election. They are the excuse to cheat. They are the rationale that they are giving themselves in advance so that later they can cheat and say, well, we have to cheat because if we don't cheat, it was, you know, it was unfair. That is, Paige, why we saw a violent mob, a violent mob engage in insurrection. It was an insurrection. It was an effort to prevent the peaceful transfer of power by preventing the Congress of the United States from meeting its constitutional obligation of meeting on January 6th and certifying the election results because Donald Trump had convinced his supporters that if that if they didn't certify the elections, somehow he would stay in office and never forget that that was the purpose of January 6th. It was to prevent Donald Trump from having to leave office. And so, you know, right now it's easy to mock Stephen Miller. It's easy to say this is a ridiculous lawsuit. But there's a reason why I say the Republicans are terrible which is that it's, I'm not saying that they're bad lawyers. I mean, they, they don't have great lawyers, but they're terrible because people there, at least some of them know what they're doing. They are laying the predicate for the next January 6th. And the next time, you know, the next post-election, God willing, will be peaceful and Joe Biden will win a landslide and Democrats will take the House and the Senate and governorships and it will all be behind us. But they are using these lawsuits in part to motivate their base and get them ginned up now 
to be even angrier, to be even more determined the next time. Paige, the other day I was sitting in my office writing my latest piece for Democracy Docket, and Bodhi came in and was kind of like staring at me. You know, he was staring at me like, okay, do I want to go out? And I don't think he needed to go out. He thought he might want a treat. And I gave him a treat and he was happy with the treat, but he kept staring at me. And I thought, Bodhi is wondering where our premium content is. I mean, Bodhi is like, you you do all of this wonderful stuff. You put all this stuff online and that's great. And you sell democracy's favorite dog bandanas, but you don't give away those for free. Where is Democracy Docket's premium content? And I said, all right, you know, Bodhi, we're going to do it. So everyone needs to know, starting um, effective now, you can go to democracydocket.com backslash membership and sign up to get premium exclusive content. It includes uh, uh, two newsletters that I write personally, one which is a litigation look ahead, which tells you everything you need to know about what I am focused on in court. There's a lot of cases in court. This will tell you the ones I am laser focused on and why. The other is uh, my democracy uh, watch newsletter, The State of Democracy, which is kind of like my take on what insiders need to be paying attention to, what you need to be paying attention to across the democracy landscape between now and the election. And you'll get both of those, plus you'll get breaking news alerts, you'll get other premium content, and frankly, you'll put a smile on Bodhi's face, because Bodhi is hoping for this premium content, and he really wants it to succeed. Thank you for listening to Defending Democracy. You can find all of the cases and articles we mentioned today linked in the description of this episode. Hey, and if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. To find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, go to democracydocket.com and subscribe to our weekly and daily newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Ali Rothenberg, Gabriel Corporal, and Paige Moskowitz. It was edited by Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.